This is the Rotunda store at the Museum of London and this is where we keep an estimated 17,000 skeletons. And they're the skeletons that have been excavated over many years with the development of London. They're normally um, excavated from, from a site that potentially might be being developed so something else is being built on it and that's why then we're having to disturb potentially burial grounds and burials. Uh, they're then taken to be processed so they will then be washed and dried and then they'll be repackaged and boxed. After the bones are processed they come here to us and we will treat each skeleton as an individual um, looking at age and sex of the person. If the bones are complete enough we measure them and can tell how tall people were or other things about the physique. In order to sex the remains of the skeleton, we look in particular at two different areas, the skull and the pelvis, and the pelvis is considered the most reliable for sexing. So here you can see that we've got a nice female skull and a nice male skull. So the way we can do that is we're looking at key areas, and on this one, although it's slightly damaged because obviously this individual had a, a disease, it's a very smooth, straight area around the brow ridges, and on this one it's a male, so they're much more marked and more pronounced. If I move that one there, you've got this area here. This is your mastoid process, and that's quite small and pointed in females, but on this one, you can see it's much bigger and more rounded in the males. But then also looking at the back of the skull, and that's the area here. This is very marked and ridged. This is all associated with muscle attachments. And on the female, if I lift that one up, you can then see that's much smoother. So this, I know, is a nice female pelvis. This area here is your greater sciatic notch, and it's very wide and broad. This area here, you've got a sulcus that's very deep, that's usually very pronounced in females. And then this part here is your pubic bone, and that's a really lovely area for looking at for sexing and also for aging. And in females, it tends to have more of a box shape, and you've got a concavity. And if I was able to put my finger like that, I could get my finger through there quite easily. And then on a male, that area, the greater sciatic notch, it's much tighter in males and not so broad. You don't tend to always have a sulcus here, so that would indicate to me that's a male. And then the area here, your pubic bone, is a different shape. It's much more elongated and you don't have the concavity. And if I was able then to try to put my finger there, you've got a, a V shape, so you really wouldn't be able to put your finger through there quite so easily. Well, the question of age is more difficult. It's much more easy to do with the remains of children up until puberty. This is the mandible of a sub-adult, and teeth for ageing sub-adults are the best way um, because they develop at key stages and at certain times, and we're then able to look at that, and we can then work out their age. And so this one has a mixed dentition of the deciduous teeth, and then you've got your first permanent molar. We'll also look at their long bones, this is a femur, this is a sub-adult femur, and that's an adult femur, so you, you can see the difference. They'll grow from the midpoint out, and the ends will fuse, so these are epiphyses, and these will fuse, so that's what you can see here on this one, which is the head part there, and then the distal end here. And another way that we'll age a sub-adult is we'll measure the maximum length, and then we'll have a chart, and then we can see what age range that's then giving us. After that, I'm afraid we rely on degenerative changes in, in the adult, and these can be seen again in the pelvis, in the backbone, and certain other parts. With the teeth, it depends more on the period that the remains come from. In, in, in the early period, from the Romans through to medieval, we find that the teeth wore down more than they do in modern peoples, and this has been calibrated and there is a fixed rate and people, uh, we try to uh, estimate the age of the person from uh, the attrition on the teeth. Uh, unfortunately, from the, uh, the early modern period onwards, the diet became softer and the teeth didn't wear down so much, so we can't use that for more modern peoples. We are particularly interested in bone pathology as seen in the skeletons. By this I mean all disease processes and the evidence for accidental or even uh, 
deliberate violence. We generally need something to be chronic, so unfortunately we need somebody to have suffered from something for quite a long time for it to actually change the integrity of the bone. Some diseases act very quickly and never, never get a chance, and although we have a sample of 600 people who, who died during the Black Death epidemic, bubonic plague or whatever the causative organism was doesn't leave any trace on the bone because the person dies within four, day, four or five days or, or recovers. Uh, this person here is a, a victim of venereal syphilis, very late stage tertiary syphilis, and this shows up in pitting on the skull. Uh, and this is a really a half a lifetime disease. This is your um, vertebra, so that's your spine, that sits like that. This is the front, that's the posterior. And this lovely melted looking area here of bone looks a bit like candle wax, and that to us is an indicator of a disease called DISH, which is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, and is usually an indication that someone's had a very high, uh, rich protein diet, and so the excess is the body's trying to get rid of it, you create more bone. So this, this lovely example of DISH is a disease also that one of the individuals is in the exhibition. Um, he was excavated from Chelsea Old Church, and he was William Wood, and he was 84 years old when he died, and he was the parish beadle and butcher and so quite possibly had access to rather richer lifestyle, hence possibly then having DISH. He also had bilateral osteoarthritis of the hips, which could also then be an indication that maybe he was slightly rotund and a little bit obese, um, and he had no teeth, he'd lost all his teeth, and I think he'd been a rather lovely character. Um, and I, th I think what was particularly great was on his death certificate, he was the only individual there because he died post-1838, he had a death certificate and it just said, death by decay of nature, uh, which I thought was rather lovely. We can also look at um, accidents such as uh, fractures of, of the long bones and we can tell whether it was a, a wound that healed or whether the signs of healing and maybe um, how long the person had lived afterwards. This area here is what we call a callus and usually you can then say the stages of healing, so whether it happened quite early on before the person died or if they may have had it for quite some time and it, it's remodelled. This is your radius, this is one of the bones of your lower arm, and they've got a fracture just in that part of the shaft. This one has had other consequences, so it's changed the alignment of this bone. This is the head, and uh, it's very, very smooth and shiny, which is an indication of osteoarthritis. And so potentially that's then secondary to the trauma. And at the distal end, the point there with your wrist, you've got all this pitting and lipping and so from having that fracture, potentially that's then changed and altered the alignment of that bone and then the use for that individual. We do see, sadly, signs of interpersonal violence. In the exhibition, there's one very interesting example of a person who was shot by a projectile and, and the metal point, the arrow, what it was, is still embedded in the backbone. And curiously, there's no sign of infection around it, but of new bone growth. So again, this person survived a pretty horrible wound, only to die some years later of the Black Death.